Great, it's great to be back here at the Institute and have the opportunity to speak. So today I'll be talking about uh, holographic uh, negativity. This is uh, based on upcoming work with Xiaoliang and Michael, both, of, uh, um, both are in the audience. And so the plan is I will tell you three things. First is what is negativity and why negativity and how is it described in the holographic theory. So first, let's discuss what is negativity. Negativity is a measure of quantum entanglement in mixed states. So we are familiar with von Neumann entropy and Rayleigh entropy. They are uh, described, um, um, they are usually described as um, some measure of entanglement of bipartition in pure states. Here we start with a mixed state for, um, for example, a density matrix rho AB on a Hilbert space that admits a tensor factorization into HA and HB. And uh, we first need to define a partial transpose of this density matrix. The way we do that is choose an orthonormal basis for A and B and simply switch the matrix elements for B, uh, B, B prime into B prime B. Um, and this density matrix after the partial transpose is still Hermitian. It still has trace one. It is defined in this funny basis-dependent basis way, but uh, its eigenvalues are real and basis-independent. So this is the thing that is nice to work with. Uh, the issue with um, taking the partial transpose is that now the eigenvalues can be negative. Uh, this is different from the eigenvalues for a normal density matrix, so this is a different kind of thing and we can ask how negative these eigenvalues are. Um, this is the origin of the name negativity, and um, in the traditional negativity is defined simply by taking a sum over all the uh, eigenvalues subtracted, um, uh, so taking the sum of all the, abs the absolute values of the eigenvalues subtracted by the eigenvalues themselves, so only the negative ones contribute, uh, one, can always, one can also define a logarithmic version of it um, by simply taking the choice of the absolute value of the transpose density matrix. That's like taking the sum of the absolute value of um, the eigenvalues and then take the log of that. So that's called the log negativity. Um, both negativity and log negativities would be zero if all the eigenvalues of the transpose mat density matrix happen to be positive. Um, so this is, for example, true if uh, the state we started with, row AB, happens to be a separable state, a kind of in, unentangled state. Uh, in this case, the partial transpose doesn't really do anything to, uh, to the, um, to, uh, doesn't change the eigenvalues to negative va eigenvalues, and therefore negativity is trivially zero in this case. On the other end of the spectrum, we can talk about a very entangled state and see how negativity is non-trivial. For example, if we take the EPR pair, this is a pure state um, on AB. AB are two qubits. Uh, we can explicitly write down the density matrix and do a partial transpose. It corresponds to doing tr partial transpose in these two times two blocks. And the resulting eigenvalues are one half, one half, one half, and minus one half. Um, so negativity is equal to one half, and log negativity is equal to log two in this case. Um, in general, uh, log negativity has the very nice interpretation that it provides an upper bound of the amount of distil distil distillable entanglement. That is, if you take the system um, how, basically asking how many EPR pairs can you possibly try to extract from um, the system on AB. So log negativity should be thought of as a quantity that gives a bound to that. Um, another thing that is nice about negativity is that it is an entanglement monotone, monotone uh, so it doesn't increase under LOCCs. It is very... Um, easy to generalize, um, just like how we generalize the von Neumann entropy to the Rainy entropy, we can generalize the negativity into a Rainy version of negativity. Uh, we could do this by simply compute the choice 
of the kth power of this transpose density matrix. And um, the re one of the reasons that we might be interested in this is that it provides a good way of understanding the normal negativity as a limit of the reigning negativity. If we can analytically continue k, um, then we can continue back to k equals 1 and try to find negativity. But in this case, neg analytic continuation is a bit subtle. Uh, from integer to real a, um, we have to discuss the even and odd cases separately. So there is a function uh, that we can define using all the even uh, reigning negativities. Um, it continues to some analytic function, which is called perhaps an even. And there is another um, uh, analytic continuation, which is in principle different that comes from the odd reigning entropies. Um, and these two don't have to agree. They can be different analytic functions. Um, the log negativity that we discussed before is, can be thought of as the funny n goes to 1 half limit of the even reigning negativity. So it is uh, it, written in this way is n goes to 1 half, but it's like uh, we start with even order for the reigning negativity, and then we continue to uh, order 1. So the order is 2n in this case. Uh, we can um, dis discuss, for various re reasons, um, two other limits that we might be interested in, um, which are different from log negativity. So the first thing is we can take the uh, odd analytic continuation and compute some kind of Van Neumann entropy at n equals uh, 1. This is uh, like a transposed version of the, uh, of the Van Neumann entropy. So I want to call it the transposed entropy. And in terms of the eigenvalues, it is simply equal to the sum of lambda i log of the absolute value of lambda i. So um, lambda i can be negative, and we don't want to take the log of negative value, so we put a absolute value over there. Um, the other limit that is uh, sometimes useful to think about is the second transposed entropy, um, which is obtained from the even analytic continuation, but so with taking some kind of derivative at, um, at n equals 1. So remember, log negativity is the value of this um, reigning negativity at n equals 1 half. Uh, this is taking some kind of derivative at n equals 1. For those of you know how to define a refined version of the Rainy entropy, this, is also, this also can be thought of as the second refined second Rainy entropy of, of the transpose density matrix. Or if you really want to think about it as a familiar thing, you can think about the Van Neumann entropy of the square of the density of the transpose density matrix. The square of the transpose density matrix always has non-negative eigenvalues, so you can just define the Van Neumann entropy for that density matrix once you proper, properly normalize it. So these are the things that we uh, will uh, discuss um, uh, because they um, are fairly simple to understand in holographic theories, um, but let me ask why do we want to consider negativity in the first place? Um, so in some sense, negativity and rainy negativities provides useful and relatively tractable measures of multipartite entanglement. I, re I say multipartite because we have not only region A and B, but also, in principle, we can consider the purifying system, which is the complement of A, B. So we really divide, for example, our holographic CFT or other systems into three parts. Um, and we're using some way of understanding how the three parts are entangled together. In general, um, if we have an arbitrary quantum system, not necessarily holographic, the structure of multipartite entanglement is very rich, and a classification of all possible entanglement structure is not well understood. However, we have seen a lot of evidence that in holographic states, things uh, simplify. Uh, the structure of multipartite entanglement is more constrained and therefore perhaps more tractable. So the idea is that we want to consider these negativity measures and study them 
um, in holographic context to gain insights to uh, a various interesting gravitational questions like those that have appeared in many of other talks, uh, including uh, wormholes of this type. So uh, this is why we want to consider negativity. And let me say that uh, what kind of models we're going to consider, we're going to study negativity. We're going to study them, broadly speaking, in two kinds of models. One is um, a toy version of holography in terms of these random tensor networks. And the second is an honest ADS-CFT type of uh, uh, theory where we can uh, derive various things using gravitational path integrals. So um, before we go to all the details, I want to give a table of the results. Um, so uh, we have two kinds of models. The simplest quantity that, um, uh, uh, that one can write down in this case, in the holographic context, turns out to be this transposed version of the Van Neumann entropy, this transposed entropy. In both models, it is given as um, a sum of uh, minimal a sum of areas of three minimal surfaces. The minimal surface for A, the minimal surface for B, and the minimal surface for the union of A, B. So for example, in this picture I've drawn um, a one plus one dimensional CFT uh, with A and B being two intervals uh, where they are sufficiently large and uh, close together so that they're in this kind of connected phase, which means that the um, minimal surface for the union is different from the minimal surface of uh, these two um, regions themselves. So in this case, the uh, transpose entropy is simply given by 1 over 8g times the sum of these three minimal surfaces. Going a little um, further, we can consider uh, this second uh, uh, transpose entropy. Um, and now the situation is that uh, it is given very simply in random tensor networks and given by a more complicated thing in ADS-CFT. So in random tensor networks, uh, it is given again by a sum of two um, extremal surfaces, uh, gamma A and gamma B. Um, but in the, the ADS-CFT context, it is given actually by a back-reacted version of it. And what this means is that um, we would need to take two copies of the boundary and glue them together um, across the union of A and B. So that's almost like we are going to compute the second reigning entropy of AB. Uh, and that defines a boundary manifold, which is the second cover of the original boundary manifold branched over AB. So that's the definition of this manifold M to AB. Uh, we're going to find the bulk solution inside and then compute um, union of geodesics, uh, a union of minimal surfaces that are homologous to A and homologous to B separately. So it's, it's, a, it's a minimal surface calculation in a deformed gravitational background. Um, the, uh, the answer in general is different from, for example, the um, area of the minimal surfaces in the original background because when we compute the gravitational back reaction, the geometry will change. And the last quantity, which is perhaps in some sense most complicated, is the log negativity, um, which in this context turns out to be related to this entanglement wedge cross-section. And uh, this is a result that follows from uh, the same kind of replica trick calculation that derives all three quantities. But in particular for log negativity, it agrees with the conjecture that was made previously by Ru and, uh, Ru and collaborators. Uh, in the random tensor network case, it is simply given by one half of the reflected entropy or equal to the area of the entanglement wedge cross-section. Uh, in the gauge gravity duality case, it is given by one half of the Rainy version of the reflected entropy with Rainy index one half. Or if you want to think about it 
uh, in terms of the canonical purification, it is given by the one half reigning entropy of A A star, where A star is part of the canonical purification of the row A B state. So um, let me make a few comments. When I quote these results from random tensor network and, for example, compare that to ADS-CFT, I'm, of course, using some dictionary to translate the bound dimension in the random tensor network to the Newton's constant. So log D is translated to 1 over 4G in these entries. Um, in the disconnected phase, where um, we can come up with two regions, A and B, which are far away, and therefore their entanglement wedge is a, un is a union of their separate entanglement wedges. Uh, in this case, rho AB is almost a separable state, and therefore the transpose on B doesn't really do much. It can be ignored, and these calculations can be thought of as some regular reigning entropy calculation without a partial transpose. And finally, we can easily do fixed area states in uh, the gauge gravity duality uh, example, and once we fix the areas of these surfaces, a, a gamma A, gamma B, and gamma AB, uh, it exactly behaves like a random tensor network. So this is, agrees with the intuition that has been generated before that random tensor network states should be thought of as some kind of fixed area states in holography. They don't have back reaction because the tensor network has a frozen geometry. So this is the result. Let me explain how to get them. Um, let me first explain what we do in the random tensor network. In this case, um, we have, um, so we are, I'm considering the type of random tensor network which uh, gives uh, this toy model of holography with very tractable entanglement structure, uh, and in particular, it satisfies all the nice things that we want to satisfy for toy model holography in the limit of large bound dimension. Um, and in particular, the root Takayanagi formula is satisfied by saying that the entropy of region A is given by the minimal cut um, in the tensor network that is homologous to A. So in general, we can define, the, we can think of these random tensor networks to define boundary states that are projected entangled pair states. Uh, that really means that we are going to think of the random tensor network as, as, as starting with EPR pairs, which are these lines uh, that is represented by L, X, Y, where X and Y um, denotes neighboring sites. Um, and then we're going to project all these EPR pairs on site into some uh, tense, into some, some state Vx. So at each site x, we are going to have a project, particular projection. For example, at the center here, we will have a projection to a four qubit state or qubit state. Um, and in a random tensor network, we're going to randomizing over what Vx we're going to project into. And after this projection, we get a boundary state. That is the boundary state we're going to work with. That is, roughly speaking, the, um, a state in the code subspace of ADS-CFT. Um, um, when we compute the Rainy negativity for this boundary state, we're going to have to average over all the projections onto Vx uh, because of the random tensor network. Uh, but that is easily achieved by summing over all permutation elements um, that we can assign to the random tensor network. So there is a calculation that turns averaging over projections into averaging over group elements that comes from the permutation group. Um, there is a permutation group element at every site of the tensor network. And in particular, calculating the rainy negativity uh, becomes a problem of calculating the partition function of a classical statistical mechanical model with an action which is, get, get, which is obtained by um, summing over um, a cost function that is defined on all the links. The cost function 
should be thought of as some kind of distance that we can define in the permutation group. It is defined by the minimal number of swaps that we need to do to go from one permutation element to the next. Yes? What is being permuted? It is the k copies that we have when we do the replica trick for computing the rainy negativity that we're permuting. I'm I'm, the, there, is a, there is a calculation that starts by preparing n copies of this tensor network and doing and computing the, op, the expectation value of some generalized swap operator to compute the reigning negativity. And when you sum over, when you average over these random projectors, it becomes a permutation, it becomes a sum over permutation elements. So this is something that one can understand in the same way that these random tensor network, network was originally investigated in the Rutaki and Nagi context. It's the same calculation as before. Yes. Is it that each vertex has some finite number of, a finite dimensional space of intertwiners and you're averaging over them with equal weights or something like that? The, What's behind the average? The each, so, so there's, each bound has a particular bound dimension. That's what I've been calling capital D. That is going to be a number that we will eventually send to very large. For example, that's the D appearing here. And random means that um, at each site, I'm going to, for example, take these four qubits and project into a random state in the four qubit state, in the four qubit Hilbert space. So the projection Vx here is random. So not a singular or any special restraint? Any state in this? Any state, yes. A totally random state. Okay. That can happen. Oh, um, because they, they come from pairs. So, so, so the idea is that you first prepare these entangled pairs, which, are, which, are, which corresponds to these links. So you should think of the link as being creating pairs of EPR pairs. And this is simply a product of EPR pairs. And then you do a projection to get a boundary state. So that's why it's called a projected entangled pair state. So, so this is the result of some calculation that one can do. Um, it becomes a classical mechanical model, classical statistical mechanical model. And at large d, neighboring spins want to be parallel or be identical to minimize the cost function. The cost function is zero if for two identical permutation elements. Um, but there is um, a boundary condition that is set by the definition of the rainy negativity that says at the boundary, we have three kinds of uh, um, boundary points, um, those belonging to the region A. Uh, the boundary condition is set to a cyclic permutation, which is on K elements. Um, there, there are points belonging to uh, region B. Because we're doing a partial transpose, that boundary condition for those points are set to X inverse, the inverse the anti-cyclic permutation, and for the other points is set to the identity. So that's the boundary condition. Uh, what this means is that the, uh, we, um, in the large D limit, we want to find the minimal action configuration. They are dominated by domain, domains, um, which, with, which, which comes domain walls, and there are various ways to come, with, come up with these configurations. I've joined two. Uh, two uh, pictures. The first picture is that you simply have, uh, so you have region A and B and the complement. In the complement, the boundary condition is set to the identity, so you have some kind of identity domain, say, in the middle, and then there is a smaller domain of X on, um, uh, on, uh, because the boundary condition on A forces it to have X, and there's another domain on, um, which, is, uh, which is X inverse. This is one possible configuration. Um, it turns out there are also another kind of configuration, which is 
more dominant than the first kind uh, when the two uh, regions A and B are in a more, disc more connected phase. This is when uh, there is a third domain, which is um, uh, which I call the tau domain that kind of interpolates between the x domain, the identity domain, and the x inverse domain. And in, for example, when k is equal to four, um, the tau domain could be a pairwise permutation that permutes the first pair and the second pair among the four elements. Uh, in general, for even uh, k, is going to permute pairs of uh, group elements in the same way. So um, let's consider what happens in an even case in general. When k is even, let's write it in terms of 2n. Um, in the first domain configuration, we have two kinds of domain walls. Domain wall between x and i, or x inverse and i. Uh, they both have the cost function or distance that is equal to 2n minus 1. Um, in the second case, we have different kinds of domain wall, which is determined by the distance between x and tau and x inverse and tau. They have distance n minus 1. Um, and the distance between tau and 1, uh, the cost of the blue domain wall here is n. So this is something one can figure out. Um, I won't give you all the technical details, but this is not difficult. You can see that um, between comparing 1 and 2, it is like you have shifted some of the cost of the domain wall in configuration A into blue domains. So the total, the total um, uh, cost is 2n plus 1. You have split it into a domain wall with cost n minus 1, another domain wall with cost n. Um, so if the blue um, minimal surface is more minimal than the union of the gamma A and gamma B minimal surfaces, then the configuration B is better. It costs fewer energy to have a domain wall, have domain, have domain walls in configuration B than in configuration A. So in this connected phase, um, B dominates, the second configuration dominates, and one can easily write down what is the log of the partition function of this model or log of Rayleigh negativity in this model. Here, uh, a leading order in log D, when log D is large, is simply given by these minimal surfaces or minimal cuts. Um, and then there is an order one contribution that comes from um, basically going through all different kinds of tiles that could achieve the same purpose. I give you a particular tau that does this. There's actually a number of them which does similar things. And one is to sum over all these different tau's. Um, so at leading order, again, one can just calculate the second transpose entropy by taking the derivative. It is given by the sum of the minimal surfaces for A and the minimal surface for B. Um, um, I, I, uh, I don't have a picture for what happens when we compute the log negativity, but let me just describe in words. When uh, this is a dominant saddle point when n is greater than uh, 1, but when we compute log negativity, we actually need to analytically continue the Rayleigh negativity back to n equals 1 half. And what turns out to be true is that this configuration becomes even though it is dominant for all n greater than 1, it is subdominant to another configuration when n is smaller than 1. So another configuration where um, instead of having um, uh, um, a tau domain appearing in the middle, but uh, what you actually do is to push the boundary of x and x inverse domain to the middle uh, so that they join at the entanglement wedge cross section, a third phase in that, uh, a third configuration in that setup starts to dominate when n is smaller than one, and it turns out that log negativity is computed by that configuration, and that's why it gives the entanglement wedge cross section. 
So let's also do the odd case. When uh, k is odd, we write it as 2m minus 1. We can do the same exercise, uh, configuration A and B. They, um, they again have this feature that um, going from A to B, I'm simply shifting a, a heavy domain wall with tension 2m minus 2 into lighter domain walls, which have tension n minus 1 in both cases. Um, so the, uh, all, the domains wall in, all the domain walls in configuration B have, have tension n minus 1. And the same story goes if they're in a connected phase, B is uh, dominant over A, and we can compute uh, log negativity in, this, uh, in the same way and obtain, in particular, this transpose version of the entropy, which is now given simply by the sum over all three minimal surfaces. So this gives the transposed entropy that I mentioned earlier. So um, in the remaining time, let me give you what happens for, um, um, for ADS-CFT. So if, uh, if we consider doing the same thing in ADS-CFT, first we formulate a problem on the boundary. Um, it is a QFT, so uh, the rainy negativity is defined at integer n as some kind of partition function Zn that is defined on some kind of n-fold cover, but the n-fold cover is branched cyclically on A and anticyclically on B. So you should glue the different copies across A in one direction and, and glue them in the opposite order uh, on B. Um, this still has a manifest replica symmetry. It has a ZK replica symmetry generated by the permutation. The, um, if we consider a holographic theory, then uh, the partition function is computed by filling in the dominant bulk solution with this boundary condition. Um, so we can ask, what are the configurations um, that we saw before, the two configurations where uh, which looks like disconnected and connected in some way. What are the analogs of these two phases in the holographic, con in the ADS-CFT context? Um, it turns out the answer is that they correspond to either replica symmetric or non-replica symmetric bulk topologies. And therefore, I'm going to claim that roughly speaking, um, in the connected phase, it's actually the non-replica symmetric uh, solutions that dominate over the replica symmetric solutions. Um, and the concrete example, so this provides really a concrete example of replica symmetry breaking in ADS-CFT. Um, um, it, it is happening because we're doing this partial transpose and uh, it wants to break replica symmetry in certain ways. So let me first discuss what's the replica symmetric solution. The replica symmetric solution is very simple. You simply try to do whatever you do on the boundary, but you do it in the bulk. You do the same thing as you would do on the boundary. So here I've drawn k equals three, three copies of the bulk. So the bulk is a ball, um, and I'm cutting the ball in, into, um, um, across two surfaces, sigma a and sigma b. Sigma a should be thought of as the surface, the co-dimension one surface that is between A and gamma A, the minimal surface of A. So it's the homology hypersurface for region A. Sigma B is defined in a similar way. We do these cuts and then we glue them together. We glue them cyclically on sigma A. The color is supposed to give the right cyclic way of doing that. And the color on B, sigma B is supposed to indicate the anticyclic gluing. Um, and this is a solution that fully preserves the replica symmetry. So it has the ZK replica symmetry. It dominates when A and B are sufficiently small and therefore in the disconnected phase. And in particular, in this case, if this is the dominant saddle, um, the tra partial transpose doesn't really change the on-shell action in a meaningful way. This is the same on-shell action that we would obtain without doing the partial transpose. So just like doing a reigning entropy calculation 
for region AB. And therefore, the entanglement, uh, the negativity, if this dominated negativity would be zero and reflecting the state is almost separable. This is the replica symmetric solution. Let's consider the non-replica symmetric solution. We have to discuss the even case and the odd case separately. In the even case, what we do is, so this is a fairly busy picture, but let me try to explain it. So I have case for n equals three or k equals six, so six copies of the boundary. Um, and I'm, I'm grouping that into three pairs. So you, should, so you should always think about them in pairs. And for the top three, uh, I'm going to glue sigma A cyclically. Sigma A is again this, uh, so it's the, it's the purple region, the green region, and the red region in, in, this, uh, in this picture. And um, in the bottom three, I'm going to glue the sigma B cuts anticyclically. So that's the yellow, the uh, light blue, and the purple one. And finally, across within top and bottom, um, each top and bottom pair, I'm going to have an extra gluing uh, in the uh, what I call sigma A B bar. That is basically the homology hypersurface for the complement region. If I do this pairwise gluing also on sigma A B bar, it is easy to understand these gluing, all these gluings as elements of the permutation group. And one can easily verify it on the boundary we simply have the, what we want because on the boundary the, uh, the gluing on boundary region A is simply um, composition of these two permutation elements is precisely equal to X, what we wanted. And on B is precisely equal to the inverse of X. Um, a solution exists with this symmetry, with this topology, and this only preserves part of the replica symmetry. The replica symmetry is Z2N. This only preserves a ZN symmetry. Um, and what we can do is to quotient by this ZN symmetry. So it will give something which is um, um, a calculation on the two copy system, it's like doing a rainy entropy for AB, but now uh, we have to insert some conical defect on a surface homologous to A and a surface homologous to B. So there's some way of writing down the uh, rainy negativity as the Anshao action computed in this way, in this quotient. Um, the point is that as N goes to one, um, it becomes simple because the conical defect becomes uh, a simple minimal surface with no back reaction, and the minimal surface is simply evaluated in this rainy two background. So in that sense, this is a fairly simple result. Um, one can, uh, again, do the same thing for log negativity, but remember log, log negativity has this funny thing that uh, it is, uh, as n goes, to, uh, n goes below one, uh, this configuration actually becomes subdominant to a third configuration, which turns out to be re related to this rainy version of the reflected entropy. So I won't time to do that in detail, but, the, but one, there are similar pictures one can draw to uh, derive the n goes to one half limit. Um, let's do the odd case. In the odd case, we call k equals 2m minus 1. And um, the, the story is fairly similar, except now I have one um, unpaired copy at the very end. So what I'm going to do is the following. Um, so here's a picture for five copies in total. Um, for the top two and the last one, I'm going to glue their uh, cuts on sigma A cyclically. For the bottom two, and also the last one, I'm going to glue their sigma B cuts anti-cyclically. And again, for the first two pairs, I'm going to glue their sigma AB bar <laughs> cut, uh, sigma AB bar pair, uh, uh, um, pairwise. And this will give, uh, so, this will give 
uh, a result through this, uh, again, uh, the standard replica procedure. This will give, at n goes to 1, a, a, a result which has no back reaction and simply given by the minimal surface of gamma A, gamma B, and gamma AB. So since I'm out of time, let me uh, simply mention that one can ask, what can we, how can we enjoy these nice results? And uh, can we use this to understand more about how they come from a special type of quantum error correction, correcting codes or some special type of tensor networks? And finally, how can we use this to study other entanglement measures of the same time? Okay, thank you.